In this video, we're going to do an introduction to lateral epicondylitis by looking at the relevant clinical anatomy and then also looking at the basic presentation of the condition. In the following video, we'll be looking at the three major special tests used to rule up lateral epicondylitis. So I want to begin by talking about this muscle, which is really important and has lots of implications in the condition. It's extensor carpi radialis brevis, or ECRB, shown over here labeled in boxed in red and over here in green. Now the origin of ECRB is the lateral epicondyle, which is shown over here on the distal end of the humerus. So off of the lateral epicondyle, there's a common extensor tendon, and the ECRB is part of that common extensor tendon. We're going to see in just a minute that there's multiple muscles that actually attach onto this common extensor tendon, which then attaches itself onto the lateral epicondyle. Okay. The ECRB also has an origin on the annular ligament, but we don't really care about that for these purposes. And then the insertion of ECRB is going to be the base of the third metacarpal. So if we follow down here, we see the muscle belly of ECRB. And then about two-thirds of the way down the forearm, it narrows into a tendon, which goes down here and attaches onto the posterior aspect of the base of the third metacarpal. So when this muscle contracts, it pulls distally to proximally, and it's going to help extend the wrist. So wrist extension is one of its actions. And really, we could say that it's going to extend specifically at the third digit. So you can selectively extend your third digit by contracting the ECRB. And this muscle also participates in radial deviation. And later on, we'll see that the special tests for lateral epicondylitis take advantage of these actions by either putting tension on the common extensor tendon through tension in the muscle or just a direct stretch on the tendon in order to provoke symptoms to help us rule up this condition. Now other than these simple actions right here, the ECRB muscle helps to stabilize the wrist when the elbow is straight or extended. For example, during a tennis ground stroke. So when you're swinging at the ball with a tennis racket, when the ball is near the ground, you have to stabilize the wrist. And when, they, when people perform that stroke, their elbow is usually pretty straight. And so the ECRB helps to stabilize the wrist in that position. The issue here is when you're doing this over and over and over again repetitively because lateral epicondylitis is an overuse injury. So when you overutilize the extensor carpi radialis brevis, it causes microscopic tears in that common extensor tendon near the lateral epicondyle. And so you end up with inflammation in that common extensor tendon and associated pain. And this inflammation and pain are hallmarks of lateral epicondylitis. Now, due to the stabilization function of ECRB, it is the most susceptible tendon to lateral epicondylitis. So there's other muscles here that actually originate off of the lateral epicondyle. So if we go a little bit proximally, this structure right here, this is the lateral supracondylar ridge. Originating off of that is extensor carpi radialis longus, or ECRL. This does not originate off of the lateral epicondyle, so that being said, it's not sharing that common extensor tendon and is very unlikely to be involved in lateral epicondylitis, or tennis elbow. But down here you see the lateral epicondyle, which is the widening distally of the lateral supracondylar ridge. And all these white tissues right here, these are the tendons of the various muscles that attach onto the lateral epicondyle. And collectively, these tendons fuse into the common extensor tendon. Right here, you see extensor carpi radialis brevis. Here's extensor digitorum communis. Here's extensor carpi ulnaris. And there's a couple of others. But only extensor carpi radialis brevis has a significant function in stabilization. And so it's going to be the most susceptible to inflammation at the common extensor tendon. So what is the typical presentation of tennis elbow? Well, there's no specific injury. Remember, this is an overuse injury. So you have to be doing the same kind of movement repetitively over time, and just over time you accumulate damage and then inflammation and pain. It's also worth mentioning that this usually occurs in the dominant arm. Considering it is an overuse injury, that makes sense. Okay? Its progression is going to be slow. It's going to be gradual. Initially, there's just going to be mild symptoms, which would include pain, restrictions in range of motion due to that pain, and inflammation. And it's going to slowly worsen over weeks and months. And common symptoms would include lateral elbow pain directly over the lateral epicondyle, or a little bit distal to it, because we're talking about the tendon here. Patients often describe the pain as having a burning quality, and they also have weakened grip strength. You would assess that with a handheld dynamometer and compare it to the unaffected side. 
and oftentimes they have pain at night. Another thing I don't have written here is radial nerve irritation. So the radial nerve, as it crosses from the brachium into the forearm, actually crosses very close to this. And so the inflammation associated with the common extensor tendon can actually uh, move and attack the radial nerve. And so patients with lateral epicondylitis may also have a positive radial nerve tension test. And you can learn more about that special test in a separate video. I'll put a link to it in the description of this video. And common activities that will aggravate the lateral epicondylitis would be those involving movement of the forearm and the wrist. So holding a racket, turning a wrench, and shaking hands. Thank you for all your support. Be sure to check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.